stale, right? Um, so actually the facets take care of that and they tell both ones, oh, it's not here anymore, it is here now. So that's the general answer to that. I think it could probably hold all the data, but it's just too slow to insert on the phone. Is the, the real answer. I, it would be neat, it's an optimization, which I haven't done, to actually send a pre-populated SQLite database to the phone first, and then just do synchronization as a binary file. That would go much, much faster, uh, but it's a little complex, so I haven't done that yet. Um, so, App Engine currently supports XMPP. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but only a subset. Barely scratch the surface. Mm -hmm. Are there any plans to have it support more protocol? There are. You know, we added a few more features to the XMPP implementation recently. I think we added present support, which I know was very people were really interested in. Um, I can't remember all of the specific ones that we added, but yes, we definitely are interested in adding more. I know there is someone. Um, so a member of my team who works on that specifically and is adding more features. So I think you can definitely hope to have more come through now. And I think that if there's one feature or like one bug that you really care about um, and you have a very compelling use case for, be sure to put that in the issue tracker. Be sure to put that in the groups to argue your case because we read all of that information. You know, my team checks those groups. We have developer relations folks that put it together. Um, but the best way, the way that we try to make decisions as a team is based on what our 20,000 applications and their developers need, what they're actually doing, so that we're helping the most people. Um, so be sure to make your voice heard about which things that you want. Question. Okay, I have uh, two questions. One is on App Engine, the other one is Monitor. So a few months ago, I got to use uh, App Engine. And uh, the thing that uh, hit me about it is that uh, the SQL capabilities were limited. So my question is, do you plan to support other database management systems or just use? Do you mean SQL specifically? Yeah. Yeah, we do. And as I was mentioning, we do have uh, adding SQL support to App Engine is something we've been working on for some time. Uh, it's difficult because of our scale and how many people that we want to help and what we want to do. But we have been working hard on it. And there is a trusted tester program for it now where you can use a SQL database with App Engine. If you look around on the Google groups, you can see uh, an email about this, a note about this, where I think you can request to participate in that program. So at some point, that will be available. Uh, it's, right now, you can use it as an, a testing thing. At some point, it will be available for everyone to use. And uh, when you say SQL, you mean other database management systems? Oh, like, like other than beyond. So we would be providing probably one specific one because it's managed. Uh, I'm not certain exactly which one or if they decided exactly which one it will be inside the testing program. Um, but it may not allow you to just run an arbitrary SQL server. Um, because that's part of the thing, you know, that we, since we provide this managed system that's not a virtual machine, it does take away some of that flexibility. If there was, you're like, well, actually, my SQL's not good enough for me. I have to use Postgres because of this specific feature. At that point, App Engine may start to break down for you as not being the best option. Um, because to some extent, we do try to hit sort of more mainstream options, even though we grow that fold all the time. But we can't provide that management, the management at the level where like, it can't fail. Not like it usually does, like it usually doesn't fail because someone's checking on it with scripts regularly, but it's actually baked into the system and monitored by us. As you know, we have a reliability team that's actually checking all the servers, every component of your app, and making sure that it doesn't fail. But if you could have an arbitrary setup of a SQL server, we couldn't guarantee that anymore. However, I would also mention that it's easy to use App Engine with EC2, with other hosting environments as well. Most of our big customers, no, most might be an exaggeration, definitely a lot of our big customers on App Engine also use a traditional hosting environment and interchange data between the two. And that works pretty well. So that's something that you can consider as well if there's some part of your application that needs that. Last question. Um, I will be so it's it's not a requirement. The what is a requirement is a that store server, the store component that can be on an internet accessible server to store the data that you need, the exported data that the synchronization um, client can sync with. 
I, when I built an implementation that runs on App Engine, because that was convenient for me, but something that I know well. I think that for someone skilled with SQL and skilled with Python development, it would probably only take two days to also adapt it to a traditional hosting environment and using a SQL database rather than using the data store. That's the only App Engine specific feature it uses is the data store. Again, because it was convenient and free, even for me. Um, but yeah, so I think if you wanted to run that elsewhere, it would be easy. Any plans to support uh, Node.js app engine? You know, people ask that a lot. Um, and I, I know that Node.js is really popular right now. I don't, um, I don't know that we has specific plans to do it right now. I know that there are a lot of communities on App Engine that have made other frameworks, like Scala, for instance, work really well on App Engine. Uh, I believe, I'm sort of uh, going into my brain a little bit, it's a little dusty, but the like, thing that's a bit different about Node.js is the way that it communicates over HTTP is really specific. Um, and so that right now, I believe, is the reason why it doesn't work on App Engine as natively. Um, over time, although we right now support uh, a streaming API in AppVision for streaming responses for doing what's commonly known as Comet, um, eventually we'd also like to implant to support WebSockets and things like that. So I think at some point, Node.js will just work automatically. I also know a lot of people are passionate about Node.js, and I think they may well get it working in AppVision. Um, so I think the answer is, you know, there's a lot of different things going on other fronts to bring it closer. I don't know of any one large specific initiative making that happen right now. Um, so, sorry. the channel API mm -hmm. um, on App Engine, um, if I can remember well, I think the shortcoming is that it doesn't support multiple users for the channel API. Mm -hmm. um, so you can't do something like a game. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you have to do that part yourself. Uh, and well, this was actually something we designed into the channel API. We thought it made most sense to give people sort of, before, something that hits the right level of abstraction. Not too low level, um, but not too high level. Something that sort of hit it in the middle. And so what we did is we said, well, what's really hard is maintaining these HTTP connections, hooking them up, making sure they work, fixing it when they fail, all that stuff. But then when it comes to and actually sending a message between them, that's also important, can be hard to get right. So we'll handle getting a message from A to B, where A is in our server and B is your client. But we'll leave everything else to you. So if you want to send a message to 100,000 people at once, then yes, you have to make something to send that. But in my experience, it's pretty easy on App Engine to do so. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can do it. You, know, you can use um, the task queue which is a great way to sort of send that off um, to a lot of these identifiers at once. You can use the new um, Perspective Search API, which you may or may not have seen, which while it's not intended for this uh, specifically, it can provide a cool way to do publish and subscribe of these messages. Um, the other thing, though, that I might also add is that if you're sending the same message to 100,000 or even 100 people at once, comment may not be the best choice. Reason why is that if so many people are accessing that message at once, it's not actually sort of point to point, one to one, it's actually sort of one to many. And it's actually probably more efficient from a caching point of view and a delivery point of view and even a cost point of view to have that be done through polling on the server because you know so many people are waiting for the same message. Uh, my question is for the Android application, do you have uh, any location-based services included or you just get the whole data set from the system? So there's nothing location-based on it right now. I think you could do that, and that would be interesting. Uh, it would be pretty easy to make that be the key when you're fetching the data. Right now, um, you know, all, we do, all that this does is it does the slice when it's fetching the data. Uh, inside your application, um, you can say, hey, I'm listening on this content URI. I want to get data for this content URI which is then serviced by the uh, Manta sync utility, which runs in a separate application. As part of that, you can give it query parameters, because that URL actually goes to a real URL on the server with JSON data. And so that um, URL can say, like, well, I want just this officer. Or it can actually be more complicated than that if you want. You can put, like, four query params in there. You know what I mean? Like, maybe I'm in this city, or I'm in this geohash grid, something like that. And it will just give you pieces of data that have those elements in it. 
So it's pretty easy to use for doing that, I think. So uh, just to add on that, uh, I don't know that you've tried out location services on Android, uh, but uh, it seems like using GPS alone mm -hmm. can be quite hectic because first thing GPS takes so long to register, then GPS uh, listeners don't seem to, to work. Like the default one uh, doesn't uh, get... Uh, My question is concerning the data store. So how secure is data in there? So it's a good question. Um, you know, I think my answer would be that it's, it's very secure. Um, it is a shared service that is used by um, multiple applications. But we work really hard on security at Google at all levels. You know, ensuring that your app is really secure, that nothing else can ever see it, and that it can't ever see anything else. And the part of the data store it uses only Google. Because, you know, um, my team is, uh, we work on one of the products at Google. But Google has a lot of products, and we have a lot of experience in working in data centers and doing stuff secure. Um, the same policies that make sure your Gmail is kept secure, if you use Gmail or other people's email, <coughs> is kept secure. It's the same policies that my team follows. Uh, and actually, I'm actually happy to say, it's just happened, I think, a week ago. Google doesn't own any aspect of your data or your product or anything like that. Uh, concerning the app. So you're saying that if I want to develop this in RPG, I'll not have to set up like the environment. You can go check our getting started guide, download our SDK, which you use to deploy an app. And you just, if the code's already there, you just hit deploy and it's running at your URL. Nothing to set up, nothing else to do. Where would a person find that? Oh, sorry, yeah, I should put a URL. It's on GitHub. So, um, it's a GitHub Manta, a GitHub Kev Gibbs uh, Manta, which will be the easiest way to find it. Oh, there you go. So yeah, there's a simple MFI application, and then there's Manta. So yeah, you can check it out there. And then I put in a fully self-contained sample that just runs itself, the local database, and uploading thing that runs to a local store server and the application that runs in the Android emulator. So you can try it all out on your local machine and dink with it. Then you can start hooking it up to a real database if you want to see how it works. So thank you. Thanks very much for coming and speaking today. Um, as a person that's mostly been on the business side, interested in learning more about coding, it seems like App Engine would be a good way of not having to worry too much about, as you said, the system and stuff. Do you have any advice, any websites, any books? Um, gosh, I think you know there's, a, there's some great books on Python um, about getting started with Python, and I think um, I think uh, it's only personal preference, but I think maybe I think it's the O'Reilly book, the first Python O'Reilly book. It's a really easy read. It's one of the only like software books I've read. It's actually just like you breeze through it. It's very pleasant. So I think that's a great way to get started. I mean. Um, of course, computer science and programming in general is a huge field, so you can learn in a rigorous way about how computer science and everything works. Or you can just dive in and make something work. I think both approaches are great. So I think, yeah, getting a book and diving in, starting with an app you're interested in, just playing with it is great. How is it that you you still have those security services from other, other providers, like Delta and Liquify and the rest? Is it that is it that the work is too much and that you cannot, you cannot be comfortable with working with all that stuff? Is it that you can also take from other parties? Are you outsourcing um, security services to third parties like Equifax? I'm not, I'm not sure, really sure. Oh, do you, by that, do you mean like uh, which part? Do you mean physical security or do you mean. No, network security. Oh, network security. Uh, you know, I don't. Uh, there's all different parts of that. Uh, I, I think, I'm not entirely confident, I think the answer is, is no. Um, you know, there, there are certain things that, you know, funding providers like VeriSign signs encryption certificates, and it makes sense for that to be consolidated in one company, you know, because that's how, like, SSL works. We do have our own security teams at Google that handle all levels of security and look into all parts, you know, from network security to software and 
intrusion detection, and all sorts of stuff like that. So I might not know exactly which part of the network security that you need. Yeah, it's, 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 it's about the encryption part, not the encryption. Not the encryption? Oh, um, yeah, I think, you know, we do use standard algorithms for encryption uh, at Google at various points. Uh, that's something I'm not an expert on, so I don't know a whole lot more than that. But I do know, you know, we make use of a lot of the standard encryption frameworks and systems that a lot of people use. We also do our own audits to those and try to make sure they're safe and give back to the community as well. Uh, also, I was if you could talk something small about the Google bot. You could say something small about the Google bot. Google bot? Yeah. Google robot? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you mean the, the crawler that's yeah, using it? Yeah, exactly. Uh, what, what about that? How does it work specifically? Oh, uh, you know, that's something I'm not an expert on. And some of the stuff, is, um, you know, I've mentioned, it's something that's for developers out here in the world, so it's fun to talk about. There's some things at Google which are still internal, you know, and I, I can't talk about. Um, specifically, the way that um, Googlebot works, I think it's, it's complicated, <laughs> because uh, you know, it has to crawl so much, and we have so many data centers. I don't even really know how it works anymore, to be perfectly honest with you, but it, it's pretty its pretty complicated. Um, but yeah, I wish I could give you a better answer, but I both don't actually really know the answer, and I don't know which things I'm allowed to talk about. One question on the Manta framework. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you determine when they, how do you determine that data has changed in the SQL server, and then also on the, on the Google uh, page itself? Sure. So, and also, to what level do you like even changes in record fields? Do you also know whether they're yeah. So how do you determine all that? That's a great question. So you know, um, when I was looking into that, deciding how I wanted to make the upload agent find changes, because that's how they would initially get introduced into the system, I wanted to not change anything about our database. And because the database is being used by Navision, which is a complicated system, you know, it, it's using the database behind the scenes. Uh, you know, primarily the programs, like a desktop program that you use. Um, I needed to do something that didn't depend on anything special. So what I do is, um, when it exports data, it just does a diff between the files. It finds for every single um, row that it would export by primary key, everything that was put in the CSV files it produces, it finds any rows that differ. And then it finds exactly which, rep uh, which uh, columns differ. And then that exactly is what it sends up. So because sort of the trick is, it turns out, computers are very fast in processing this sort of stuff. You know, and exporting the 200,000 rows of transactions, finding the four that have changed takes like five seconds on a modern computer. So it just does that every hour in order to be absolutely sure it's seen everything. Because depending on something like a timestamp or an additional field, I couldn't be sure it would be present in all databases. So instead, it just sort of checks it by hand every time, comparing the whole dump from last time to the whole dump from this time, and finding specific rows that have changed. I think that would probably continue to work well for exporting up to maybe like four to five million rows on the local machine. After that point, then you might need to change it a little bit and the ways that you did that. But it would be easy if you, if you have a property, like a timestamp that's changed in the SQL Server, you could just use that in exporting. That would be a lot easier, to be honest. Um, so that's how it detects changes on the upload agent. Basically, it diffs those files, finds exactly the differences, the uh, insertions, the updates or changes, and the removals. And it processes those and sends up the change data. The, um, the way it finds on the server is that the server actually stores every revision of data that's ever changed. So let's say, um, you know, I showed you here, I took a client and I changed their savings balance through a SQL command. Um, on the store server behind the scenes, it stores everything as revisions. And it stores every, uh, every time the object changes as a different revision. And that has a couple of cool properties. One, it means that if there's ever a problem, you can see where the data was at any point, and you can see who made the change. Was it the upload agent, or was it someone uh, on the phone that made the change? You can see exactly what they changed. Um, but because it knows every revision, What's possible is that when you say, well, show me everything that happened from 5 p.m. on, well, you find all the revisions that happened from that period on. And that's how you know something changed, and that's how you know that the client needs to download it. Because it only does that, it means that when the phone syncs, it's very um, efficient for use of data. Because the phone asks, show me what's changed for this officer 
from this period of time, it only sends you exactly what you need um, because it knows on the server what that is. About the data store, I've only played with it very, very little. And I seem to remember that big table only supports key value pairs up to one megabyte in size. Mm -hmm. uh, is there in the data store an abstraction for splitting a block, block type into more, or do I have to write that myself? There is, and it's a great question. That wasn't there when we introduced that feature, but we added this feature. It's one of the features we rolled out over the years, which is a blob store. And uh, it supports blobs up to, I think maybe it's five gigabytes or so per blob. But you can put as many as you want, small or large. Um, and those blobs can be served up directly to the user uh, without you having to interact with them at all, which makes it much more efficient for however large they are. You can also write blobs from the server, receive uploads directly, streaming from the client, every which way. Cool. Is this something I'm thinking about in the sense that you have this framework that can do what you want to set up uh, a web application? And uh, now, this uh, application needs to get data, to pull data from a database in different languages, but still have it be implemented in one system. And uh, now the question is this, uh, does Manta, can it do that, or is it totally? That's, that's a really great question. Um, yes, I actually, uh, although I was only here a short period of time, I wish I was here for longer, because I've had such a good time here. I wanted to make Manta support multiple applications from the get-go. And so that's why I abstracted away the sync utility, so that it lives as a separate application on the phone, and just makes the data available to any application. So you can build a bunch of small applications that work with the data, and that works fine. You can also have totally independent applications, um, because it supports different organizations. If you saw when I uh, saw off, I'll leave it off. Um, when you run it, um, it knows which organization it's syncing for, but it can sync for multiple organizations. So in this one, um, it synced for simple MFI. That was one of them. And multiple applications can work off the simple MFI data set. But you can also have multiple data sets in there as well and have them synchronized from that. And it just manages syn always synchronizing that data and having it present. So does that answer your question? Some degree, yes, and uh, I think some are not. Because uh, mine was this way. Because the implementation of that application I'm making is run on a totally different level, in the sense that uh, you get a vendor and IIS who mm -hmm. actually have the platform ready for that application. But now the challenge is because the data itself is home based. So you're looking at a way of trying to dig into the database but without compromising the, the functionality because it's totally sample theory. You cannot, you cannot interfere with that, uh, the proprietary software for that database. The database. But uh, for that case, you will see smart operates using the cloud synchronization aspect. Mm -hmm. It might work in the sense that uh, when, okay, is it limited to ubiquitous devices only, or it can go also across the web in the sense that not limited to mobile web, but also there. Do you mean, and, and pardon me for because I have a little trouble understanding, you're saying is it able to do both like mobile applications and web applications? Is that what you mean? Uh, okay, the mobile part of it is more of a uh, verification of security. Uh, but it totally runs on the, on, the, on the web. It says that it's something that can be accessed by over any web browser. But on the phone, it's limited in terms of so the phone aspect is merely to offer security verification along the process. But on the web, the system is where the users you will use it. But now the, the headache around it is I'm faced with a challenge that there's a database that trying to take time to understand which language was written because I researched it something like 10 years ago. It's a 10 years ago application, so I can't go deeper. So can Mantra do that? Or was I was thinking of doing so to try to maybe understand the sequence that we need and maybe just to put the data in here so that the application can work. And then pardon me because I have some trouble hearing. Is, can are you able to? Unfortunately, it kind of exceeds my understanding. I think that um, I wish, I don't think I'll do 
do justice to everything that you've said. I wonder, because it sounds like this is a somewhat specific use case, um, if, if you have time, if you could stay and just ask him specifically afterwards, do you have time to do that? Just because I think I'm going to say it correctly. Um, about working at Google, you said you put together a team to start the App Engine project. Mm -hmm. So you just basically woke up the idea, or you would uh, had the idea and set out to do that, or you were kind of you know put in charge of coming up with some sort of hosting thing. How how no. was the philosophy in that inside? You know. Uh, more, more on the former. You know, it's why a lot of the great things that happened to Google, a lot of the great products, was just someone's idea, and they got motivated to work on it. And I think that uh, Google tries to reward that and to make that possible, which I think is really great. It's something they you know, might call bottoms up or bottom up. Um, and so, you know, specifically with App Engine, it was a combination of like a, pulling a team together and thinking of ideas and coming up with an idea. But it wasn't ever at any point someone said build this. Instead, we said, we're interested in doing this. And at the same time, you don't just say, I'm interested in doing this, and suddenly they're like, sure, do whatever you want. You know, you have to build a prototype, really show your business case, work on it, do, do a lot of stuff that way. But it's an environment where people try to support you in doing that and support those new innovations. So, yeah, I think it's a, I think that's something that I really liked about working there, that it's, it, that's not something that everyone wants to do. It's something that some people want to do. I think it's really great that they, make it easy to do that, rather than having to be sort of who you know. Rather, it's like, what can you build? And then try to sell people on that. I was wondering, how is it for you, going from Google to coming to work in Kenya? How is that?